Okay, as Jay said, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're doing well and uh, getting ready for this wonderful first Shabbos of the year. Shabbos Shuvah, hope it should be an inspiring one for everyone and a good start to the year to come. Uh, we are going to study a couple of short Rashi's today from Vayelach, uh, looking specifically at the passage about Hakel. Uh, one of the mitzvahs mentioned in this parsha, which is really the summation of the Torah, Moshe's last speech to the Jewish people, is the mitzvah to gather uh, the entirety of the Jewish people um, after every Shemitah cycle and to read the Torah very publicly uh, in front of them on that occasion. It's called Hakel, the gathering ceremony. I gave a share about it, I think, last year on Zoom. I think it's probably posted on the website if anyone wants to see. Uh, um, so I understand you call it the band of tomorrow. Everyone wants to see that share again. Uh, but we'll go back to the Psukim here a little bit. Torah tells us very specifically when this Hakel ceremony is supposed to take place. It is supposed to take place at the end of seven years, on the occasion of the Shemitah year, on the holiday of Sukkot. So individually, each of those stitches of the Pasuk makes sense. The end of seven years means after uh, the Shemitah cycle. Bemoed Shnata Shmita means on the Shemitah cycle, and Bechaga Sukkot means on the holiday of Sukkot. The problem is that there seems to be a contradiction between the first stitch and the second stitch of the Pasuk. If this is supposed to take place, Miket Sheva Shanim, after seven years are already over, then how could it be Bemoed Shnata Shmita? How could it be on the Shemitah year, which is the seventh year? Essentially, the Pasuk is telling us that this should take place on Sukkot of the eighth year of the Shemitah cycle. So year one is the first year of the cycle, year seven is the actual Shemitah year, year eight is really the first year of the next cycle, it's the post-Shemitah year. That year eight, that post-Shemitah year, that first year of the next cycle, is when Hakel is supposed to take place on the holiday of Sukkot. So why does it say, B'moed Shnata Shemitah, on the Shemitah year? So Rashi resolves this contradiction, by saying, This always takes place on the first year of the Shemitah cycle, which is really year eight, the year after Shemitah actually takes place, which would be like next year. We're in the middle of the Shemitah year now. We just started this past week. Um, this is year seven. So next year would be year eight. So in a year from now on Sukkot, that's when Hakel would be taking place. Lama Koreo Sashnat Shmita. So if that's true, it's on the eighth year, why is it still called Shnasa Shmita? It's not Shnasa Shmita anymore, it's actually post Shmita. Shadain Shviz no Hegespa. No, because still the halachos of Shviz, of Shmita, still apply actually on the post Shmita year, in year eight. But Katsir Shal Shviz, Hayotse Lemotse Shviz, where it's practical, is in the produce of Shviz that still comes out and blooms in the eighth year. So it's very important halacha being revealed to us by Rashi over here, which fits into this cycle of when the hakel takes place. It's very important and relevant for this year. Uh, vegetables and fruit gain kedusha shviz, the sanctity of shvi, shmita at different times in the year. So vegetables already from the beginning of the year, when they sprout, they already have kedusha shviz. So you have a tomato that's growing right now in Israel, that tomato has the sanctity of the Shemitah year with all of its relevant halachos. However, the fruits that are growing right now, most fruits, every fruit and every vegetable has a slightly different cycle. There's all kinds of charts uh, kind of explaining when the cycles of all these fruits and vegetables are. But for the most part, fruits that grow on trees that are growing right now and are picked right now do not have Kedusha Shviz. They don't have the sanctity of the Shemitah year. The reason for that is that the fruits that are blooming now, that are coming out now, are really fruits that took root last year before the Shemitah year began. And now they're just being, um, they're just blossoming. They're just coming to fruition and will be picked. So the, the fruits that are being picked now are actually the fruits of the pre-Shemitah year. The fruits that will be growing next year, post-Shemitah, on the eighth year, are the fruits that took roots and that started to grow during the Shemitah year. They only come to fruition in the year eight. And that fruit still has Kedusha Shviz, even though the Shemitah year is over. So if you pick an orange next Rosh Hashanah, next Sukkot, that will have Kedusha Shviz. Well, as the one from this year actually doesn't. The ironic twist and the complication of these halachos, we're actually in the Shemitah year now, 
some of the fruit is not yet Kedusha Shviz. Next year will be post Shemitah here, and some of the fruits will have Kedusha Shviz. It's very confusing, but that's how uh, Rashi helps to explain this pasuk. It is the eighth year, but it's still called Shnasa Shmita because many of the halachas of Shmita are still relevant, especially the fruits that are still growing, which have Kedusha Shviz. That's how he explains uh, this piece of the pasuk and the dating of this ceremony. So this happens, they're already coming on Sukkot, you know, for uh, for the holiday, the pilgrimage festival, they're all in there already in Yerushalayim, and in that Makom HaSherif Chah, in Yerushalayim, Tikras HaTorah Hazos, the centerpiece of the Hakel ceremony is the reading of the Torah, Neged Kol Yisrael Be'oznehem, in front of the entire Jewish people in their years, in their ears, excuse me. The Torah specifies who is supposed to come to this ceremony, Hakel Es Ha'am, Ha'anashim, Ha'anashim, gather the whole nation, and it specifies who the whole nation is, the men, the women, and the children. So Gemara and Chagiga darshans out this pasuk, and Rashi quotes the understanding over here, that each of the people that come, each of the groups that come, the men, the women, and the children, each come and fulfill a different purpose, a different mitzvah of sort. Hanashim, lil mode. The men are coming for the schar, the benefit of the mitzvah of learning Torah. So men are obligated in that mitzvah, women are exempt from that mitzvah, and therefore, when the Torah is read in public, the men are fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. Hanashim, the women, are also gaining schar, they're also gaining reward from this, not for Limud Torah, which they're not obligated in, but for Shmiyasa Torah, listening to the words of the Torah, inculcating them into their, pre- into their being, into their identity, and being able to fulfill the mitzvahs of the Torah, which, of course, they are obligated in. So similarly, men and women both have a role in terms of hearing the words of Torah, and taking them in. They both fulfill a mitzvah in that way. But what's the purpose of bringing the children? The hataf, lama bayim. They don't fulfill any mitzvah. They're not obligated in mitzvahs. The answer the Gemara gives, which Rashi quotes here, is kidei latet schar lemivyehem, to give reward to those who bring them. A very complicated phrase. Much has been written about this Rashi and about the Gemara and Chagiga and about the bringing of the children to Hakel in general, many beautiful ideas about the impact that a whole scene of Torah can have on children and the imprint that it can place upon them and um, the idea of why children are included in this ceremony that must be for the entirety of the Jewish people. But just to narrowly read this answer, it seems a little bit strange. The children are brought simply to give reward to those who bring them. Now, if men and women are coming, then they have no choice but to bring their kids. <laughs> they can't leave them at home. So there's really no choice in the matter. So what kind of schar is it for those who bring them? There's no reward in that. They're obligated to do that. They have to do that. They have no choice but to do that. The men and women are both obligated to come, then they have to bring their children. This talking about young children over here. So maybe some suggest that what the Rashi is suggesting is that the fact that the Torah says to bring the taf gives us a mitzvah to bring the taf, even though you'd be bringing them anyways, that is That is in order for us to gain reward for bringing them. Even though we have no choice in the matter, God elevates the act to a mitzvah act so we can glean reward even from that. I think it's a beautiful idea. Many other answers are given to that question, but a beautiful idea about the extent which God goes to in order to give us many, many mitzvah opportunities all around us, all the time for the express purpose of elevating us and for the express purpose of enabling us to gain as much schar, as much reward as possible. Hopefully we'll be able to tap into that and gain that reward for ourselves and for all those who we love and those who we know. Have a great Shabbos, everyone. Be well. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom.